My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And hello, thank you for joining us for another episode of the podcast. Today, my guest is Mark Ryle. Is, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, that's right, David. Okay. Mark is a recently retired economics and mathematics professor. He taught in Toronto, Canada and Hamilton for 24 years. He coached hockey, cross country running and track and field. And I just want to jump into it, Mark, because I know we're on a little bit of a, of a time uh, constraint. Can you talk about your background in economics first and then how you became interested in genetic engineering? And then we'll get into your novel. Sure. So uh, I taught uh, economics and, as you mentioned, at Royal St. George's College in Toronto and then Hillfield, Strathallen in Hamilton. And uh, I'm actually my two least favorite courses in university were micro and macroeconomics. I did not like them at all. And you, I, I would have said I would never want to teach them or get near them after that. But ironically, I did end up teaching them and I loved them. Uh, I had to relearn the stuff myself and then try to relate it to my students. I don't have a, I have a PhD in educational finance. It's not in uh, economics per se. Although I, I guess I did do a master's in uh, business uh, at uh, York University in Toronto. So I have some, some background there, but, uh, and my, my bachelor degree was in science. So um, I'm a little eclectic, maybe a little mixed up as some would say, but uh, I like the variety. I don't, I don't blame you. So what you, what got you to the point where you determined that you wanted to write a novel, which we can call it speculative fiction or science fiction. I'll let you explain that. But what got you to the point where you wanted to write the novel that you have written? And then we'll get into that a little bit deeper. Sure. So it actually comes from an athletic side I have. I'm very, um, intense uh triathlon competitor and i um i worked hard at it and i got to the point where i represented um canada at the world championships uh in 2018 and 2019 so the last two world tries they were canceled in 2020 because of covid so um that 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 competitive side of me the athletic side made me always feel that i was um getting okay, maybe becoming a better swimmer because I'm a terrible swimmer and learning, you know, there's a lot of skill there. But on the running and the biking front, I could feel myself uh, slowing down, like just literally uh, getting a little slower each year, even though I'm training hard because I'm getting older, right? I'm now 62 years old. And you can feel, um, no matter how hard you train, you can feel that you are, you know, you know, time is marching on and, uh, you know, yeah, you right. can feel that. The competitors can feel it too. The ones who are just a few years older, say 64, 65, they feel like the ones who are 60 or 61. And well, we're all in, have an advantage, right? Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, you look you look great for that age. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, there are a lot of people that age or even younger who look like much, much, much older. Um, so I think a lot of it really has to do with how you live. So you have to kind of accommodate or work around the limitations or changes is probably a better way. So right. what made you decide, hey, I want to write a science fiction novel? Yeah, so just going back to the uh, you know, the physiology and the competition, uh, um, I started reading about it just out of interest. Uh, you know, what, why are people, why do they get older? How much should performance drop off? I found out that it maybe will drop off almost 1% a year, your aerobic mm. capacity um, at my age. It doesn't drop as, off as quickly when you're 
35 or 40, but it does start accelerating uh, in your 50s and 60s so as you approach death, really. And uh, so I, I, I read about it and I discovered um, that there is a lot of very profound and serious research uh, going on in the area of aging, anti-aging, stopping aging, maybe even reverse aging. And um, so my initial reaction was, oh, that's sort of cool. It'd be neat if maybe in a few years I could stop my aging and and not see this decline. But then I thought, well, what about the world? Forget about me and my triathlons. What about our entire world? What would it be like uh, if they say stopped aging or going further than that, reversed aging? What what would be the, prof the profound, there must be profound implications of that on humans, on society structures, on business. Um, so that was the start of my novel is uh, just starting to write about that. So what do you think are the implications? I mean, where do you think things will be based on what you read? Let's say 50 years from now, 100 years from now, what do you think based right. on what you read? Well, there's no doubt in my mind that genetic engineering will, will be, um, it's already taking off and there's a frontier here and we are, we are just now jumping on that frontier. Think of it as a huge wave, maybe a tsunami. And that's, um, it's a breakthrough in science. It's literally changing the human genome structure, not just nurturing people, but literally changing their human nature, their fundamental, the backbone of what makes them unique as humans. Uh, so that genetic engineering is going to uh, accelerate. It's going to be a huge part of science and society, and uh, it's going to have massive positive implications but there are also uh, like other uh, technologies like nuclear, we're gonna have to watch for it. We're gonna have to keep a close eye and make sure we harness it positively. It does seem that with the advances of um, genetic engineering, if you combine those with technology where we have deep, deep fakes, you've got uh, social media, social engineering taking place in our society. I mean, you can see that in the news where people don't seem to be able to discern fact from fiction or science from mythology. They can't tell the difference anymore. So, you know, where do you draw the line? Or I guess what I should say is where is the line drawn by society? Yes. There, well, the applications of genetic engineering, there's going to be a very broad um, breakthrough there. It's already happening, and uh, we can talk about some of the specific things if you want. But drawing the line isn't anybody's, any single person's job, as you can imagine. It's um, There's so many different actors involved. You have um, science foundations like the Natural Science Foundation in China or the National um, Institutes of Health, the United States, massive uh, foundations funding this. You've got university professors and programs, uh, uh, UCLA, Harvard, MIT, Kyoto University, just all across the world looking into this uh, stopping aging and reversing aging. And then you have um, a, a very large number of private corporations uh, trying to, uh, you know, garner profits and, uh, and they're quite involved in this too. So you have a, you know, public private players, individuals, large foundations, and you have politicians standing behind some of this. So it's uh, nobody in particular is going to be able to control it, uh, which sort of makes it nice. Maybe nobody has total control, but it also makes it difficult to completely control it. What influence do you in terms of content when we look at the plot structure, the characters, the direction, um, the, the particular style of writing. Were you a big reader before? Yes, uh, I have. Well, even though I've never really taken an English course other than grade 12 English, um, I did do a fair amount of reading on my own in, uh, in my 20s and 30s especially. So some of my influences, just say in the science fiction area, were um, definitely um, Ray Bradbury, um, definitely George Orwell, uh, Margaret Atwood, um, Franz Kafka was probably one of my favorite, uh, writers, artists. So I, I wouldn't say he's science fiction, but very mm -hmm. psychological, very deep, paranoid, psychological. I love that. Um, Borges, uh, from South America, 
those type of writers uh, had a big influence on me. And in my book, there are aspects of each of them. Um, in fact, in my book, uh, my heroine, uh, Dr. Frida, uh, quotes um, quotes uh, um, Franz, Franz Kafka. Uh, he had a, one writing called the building, called, I think it's called the Wall of China, or about the building of the Wall of China. And she quotes him in there. So I had a bit of fun with that too. <laughs> Do you think not having a background in creative writing was a hindrance or a benefit for you? Because from from my own personal perspective, I went to college, you know, studying to get a BA in English with an emphasis in creative writing and working on my first novel, I find it exceedingly difficult because I keep thinking about the plot structure and the characterization and this element should mm -hmm. be here. Does it adhere to this dramatic arc structure? And you keep riddling yourself with, with, with these things where I could go back. Did you have any of that? And did, do you feel that, you know, not having that background was a benefit or, or perhaps a hindrance? In a way, I think it might have been a benefit, and uh, so your situation might be a little more uh, exacting, and especially if you're a perfectionist, right? And, and you could it's be, hard, you could, yeah. yeah, you can be overanalyzing. And I, I, if you take the game of golf, for example, right? At some point, you just got to get out there and hit the ball and play. You can't overanalyze, look at too many videos, read too much instruction. You just got to get out there and find your game, right? So I had a lot of help, though, David, with. Um, editors and friends, uh, it was invaluable. I could not actually have uh, published a novel without that feedback, which was sometimes hard to take. Like, Mark, get rid of this chapter. This chapter is stupid, you know, even mm -hmm. though it's sort of neat, it lends nothing to the story. Or Mark, you need, you know, this is too linear. You need some flashbacks and other, you need to go back and forth in time. Uh, sure. So things like that was what were invaluable, really. So uh, altogether, how many, how many drafts would you say you did? All right, I did an initial draft, showed that to a couple of friends, and then I sat on that for several years. I, oh, I, wow, I, I, okay, so I shouldn't really beat myself up that much. No, no. I no, just I, started yeah. it like <laughs> three months ago, okay. No, my first draft was 10 years ago. Uh, now I tried showing that, and it was probably premature. I probably should have gotten more feedback from other editors, but I tried showing that to some publishers in New York and Toronto, and I couldn't get anybody to read even one paragraph. Uh, it's very competitive and I have, you know, I'm a first time author. So, but that was probably uh, serendipity because it forced me to withdraw and then um, put it aside and then come out in the last couple of years, genetic engineering has really taken off and also self-publishing has been more viable. So, uh, and I got much more valuable feedback from uh, from some real science fiction writers or certain readers and uh, from some artists and feedback on the writing process, but also feedback on um, characters and dialogue. It was, it was quite, quite helpful. And that took a lot of time, that took about maybe over another year of part-time editing and work, you know, an hour or two a day, at least over that year. And then finally I got to the point where I had a couple of people just read it over for that was, you know, a little edit editing, uh, make sure there's no grammatical things. You're not missing a um, quotation mark or something like that. And yeah, now, then, then I then felt confident, confident. Yeah. Now, did you go the route of self publishing or go through a uh, conventional publisher? Yeah, so since I had already tried the conventional, I felt this time, especially because self-publishing is much more viable and also things like your podcast really is a great way of uh, helping you self-market. Um, the, uh, I, I didn't even hesitate. I went right to the self-publishing. I used a platform called draft to digital which I've been really happy with and they allow you to publish on uh, you know multiple retailers at the same time. So Draft to Digital allows me to use Amazon, Apple, um, Kobo, and various others across the board. Okay, now that's strictly a digital book. It's not a tactile experience, right? Well, believe it or not, Draft to Digital 
put me on a beta program for testing print book and they just released my print book. So they're starting to do print books. Uh, so if someone orders my book, um, what they do is they print it on demand. So they don't, they don't print out 50 copies or 100 copies, store them anywhere. It's basically on demand. You order a copy, then it takes two or three weeks, but you get delivered a copy. Okay. Yeah. They just started that. So let's, break into the unknown here what's the title of the book because i don't think you've articulated that yet it's called age decoded and there's a hyphen between age and decoded now how did you come to that specific title did you experiment with other titles uh i think yeah i think i had another one i don't remember what it was so that's a good question um well it's a it's a play on the the action of decoding. So decoding is, is something that's done genetically. You're working with the genetic code, right? So that's the engineering side, but it's also um, a play on the word age, like a group, uh, mm -hmm. an era, an era, a time when, when people, humanity, it, that age of that group of people is, um, is decoded or changed, maybe less, maybe less human. Now, as far as the cover, did you, how did you come to determine what the cover would look like? Did you have something already in mind or was that given to you by the publisher? How did that work? No, actually, that's a that's a great question, David. Um, the, the cover, I am also an artist and I tried whipping up something on my own and it did not, just didn't suit the book, I thought. So I reached out to a local um, artist, um, uh, a technical person who does things like covers and books and book binding and all that. Her name is Tanise Goddard. She's from Hamilton. And Tanise said to me, well, you know, you don't need a picture of a female on here. I know your heroine is Dr. Frida, but you're really depicting the future genetics, the mystery. So she said, I think you just need uh, a, a, an abstract type of a design. So she looked through, she goes through images that you are copyright and you pay for them. And she picked out a couple and uh, I, I immediately really liked the one that she picked. It has a sort of a hint of DNA, although it's not, a, mm. it's not an exact strand of DNA and a hint of mystery, almost like a star, like beautiful blue um, design and uh, no picture of any human, no female, no heroine, but just uh, that mystery that uh, peering into the future, that speculative, like you said, it's a speculative fiction. So I thought she did a great job and therefore I went with that. Now, from people reading your book and let's say maybe watching this or listening to this after reading your book, what would you want to communicate to them? I know there's the old saying that if you want to you know, send a message, use Western Union. I'm sure you've heard that. But a lot of authors didn't adhere to that. I mean, certainly George Orwell, uh, the great Ray Bradbury didn't do that with Fahrenheit 451. They made their messages very clear. How do you feel about that? And, and you know, what do you want readers to take away? Well, I think, well, just with this podcast, I'd like them to take away the message that you never know. You could be a creative person, depend, regardless regardless of your background, whether you're a math science guy like me or, or someone more trained in English and, or arts. Um, you can't be a creative person. You may have to just wait till you find that stage in your life where you want to express yourself. And it might take a long time. It took me a long, long time to, to do that. Uh, so that's one message. I know that's not right in the book, but it's in this podcast. So uh, for your listeners. And for, uh, for the book, it's the message that um, humanity is humans and humanity and intergenerational relations of grandfathers, mothers and daughters and children and grandchildren is a precious, precious thing. And we must be very, very careful about uh, tampering with that or changing that and going, going you know, willy nilly into the future with this technology. Do you 
is is it i don't know if this i mean tell me if this is a fair question or not could you provide like a brief synopsis or overview sure yeah okay without giving away too much of the uh <laughs> right exactly yeah so in the beginning uh, there's my my heroine dr frida uh, uh invents age decoding which is the crispr genetic engineering technique used to finally stop human aging and um, that's in the year 2053. So let's say about 32 years from now, right? And she's very nervous about that though. Even though she's the genius behind that procedure, she has moral and ethical um, hesitations and uh, reservations about it. So much that she tries to uh, delay the implementation, maybe even stop and try to give pause to it and set up these committees to look into the social and ethical moral um, implications. The government and the corporations involved do not want her getting in the way and stopping it because it would be very popular for most people would go for this. They want to offer it and they do offer it for free to everybody. It's about a 20 minute procedure, publicly available, free. You just go in there and they age to code you. And, and that's what happened. So they pushed free to aside and not, and she was pretty, she was pretty loud about it in the end. She won a Nobel prize for it too. Um, so she's a big name. They pushed her aside and to, to basically to really, um, uh, contain her, they faked her suicide. They actually kidnapped her and faked her suicide. Okay. Um, and so they take her underground, um, her family, her daughter, Zymana and her father, uh, Jesus, um, his name's Jesus, uh, even though he's a Buddhist, uh, he, uh, they both think she has tragically killed herself. Um, although her daughter has this inkling of suspicion about something just in the gut, but, uh, officially she's killed herself, but actually what's happened is she's underneath, she's being contained by the government and forced to work on reverse aging, which they also want to implement if possible. And uh, so the rest of the book is how all of these characters are dealing with this. I also have a couple of people working within the government who are um, also um, on the right side, trying to be trying to be moral and whatnot. So, you know, slowly but surely people, you know, there's mm. some discoveries and whatnot and some attempts to rescue a few Frida and whatnot. So I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's the summary. How, how important do you think character development was to you? It was very important. Uh, ironically, I started with who I thought would be a main character. I started right in with what is now chapter six. It's a young man named Jason, but that didn't really, it really didn't resonate and it wasn't commensurate with the message and the plot as much. So that sort of fizzled out a bit, although he still became a, ni a nice young man to insert into the novel. Um, Frida's character, I didn't think she was going to be the main character, but as I wrote this more and more and edited it more and more, I thought, you know what, she, she's got to be. And uh, her daughter is also a very strong character, the one who's suspicious about her suicide. So you got those uh, three main characters. And there's one insider who emerges. He wasn't even in written into my book until um, this year, really. Remember, I started writing this 10 years ago, and he's an insider who um, there's a he just emerges as someone you need some you need someone working for the good people on the inside. And so uh, his, his name's Tavon Brooks. He's African-American and he has um, he has a background where he worked his way up so, so, um, um, I guess, diligently. And he was just such a hard worker and finally got his MIT um, degree and he's an expert in statistics. He ends up in this government and he can see the wrong that's been done and he finds out. Uh, so he is tasked really with the job of trying to rescue Frida. Being your first book, how do you feel that the overall experience went for you? Well, it was more surprising than anything. I, I'm the last person I would have thought would have written a, uh, a fiction book. I, you know, I've done, a, I've done a lot of writing of reports and whatnot, nonfiction, never would I have thought of taking a crack at fiction. So to me, it was, it was, it was tough. It was a great learning experience. Um, 
but it was a it was a huge surprise. It was almost like an awakening, and uh, I'm still pinching myself, thinking, you know, that's great that you did this, you know, and it's it's um, it's a risk because you you're putting it out there, and uh, also I'm not a genomicist, right? So it's out there, and people are reading, and and uh, it's speculation, and you know, there's going to be some probably some errors in it or some uh, you know misinterpretations of the science, but. Uh, actually, so far it's held up pretty well from what I've been reading since I published. But uh, so surprising and uh, I guess exciting uh, and a little nerve wracking because of the uh, risk in doing it. Right. Yeah. Well, you put yourself out there and you've got this to show for it. So congratulations on that. Are, are there any plans to perhaps uh, put together a sequel? It sounds yes. like it could be open ended. Yes, uh, it, um, it is open ended. And uh, I would be interested in doing that right now. I'm actually working on a nonfiction book. So that's going to probably take my time for a while. But I am uh, percolating, uh, ruminating, let's say over uh, the topic for a sequel, whether it would be in the area of genetic engineering, or I'm thinking maybe something more along um, uh, neurophysiological integration which comes into my novel a little bit too, like the almost like the Elon Musk Neuralink technology. Um, I, yeah, I could think of several directions that it could go in actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just on the basis of what you've described alone, it could go in, in several different directions. Yes. So I think that's absolutely wonderful. Um, you basically went through all my questions and I wanted to ask you to, if you could uh, basically repeat. So people who do want to go ahead and, and read your book, can you explain where they could go ahead and download it or purchase a paper copy of it? Sure, David. Um, the, the novel is called Age Decoded. So age hyphen decoded. And my name's Mark Ryle. And uh, if they just type that into their favorite retailer like Apple or Amazon, uh, they will see it'll pop up with that beautiful blue abstract cover we talked about. And um, so they can order it on those uh, through those retailers. Um, I think the price is around ten dollars US twelve ninety nine Canadian and and pounds I can't remember, but uh, around ten dollars around the US. but anyway, so they they'll see it there. That's the ebook. If they want the print book, it's just coming out. So I think you'll now see it on Amazon. I can't remember if Apple has it yet, but it should be there very soon. Barnes and Noble and the others have it already. The the print book, um, you'll see next to the um, novel age code, you'll see the two options. The print book is a little more expensive. I think it's uh, something like um, $21 US, and $27 Canadian, et cetera. So um, yeah, so they can, pick it through those retailers. Okay. Any parting thoughts uh, before we let you go? Well, I wanted to thank you for uh, being an artist and uh, a supporter of uh, other artists. And I know that deep inside you and also many listeners, there is a, there's a strong creative artistic uh, person that wants to express themselves and um by doing this podcast you're you're actually allowing many other people to uh carry on that torch and uh i i encourage you and all your listeners to uh when the time is right to to give it a go and because you only live once right and it's something that will live beyond you unless they solve aging <laughs> then we then we're all going to live forever but uh, probably not so it's it's a wonderful thing to give it a shot Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. I think it's the one of the ways that we can leave something of, of ourselves behind for future generations. Right. And I think that there's also a sense of relief or release when you kind of give of yourself and part yourself into some type of artistic expression, too. I think that's another great quality of it. Well, listen, Mark, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much. And, and have a great rest of your day there, okay? Thank you. It's an honor being on your show, David. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. 
If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.